Again, the target docking adapter was in this position, and we came up directly from below. And at approximately a half a mile, Gene called out, I've got the cone lights. Now, the cone lights are the lights in here where you can make the docking. And again, even a half a mile, we knew that the shroud couldn't be on here. <laughs> However, we had a full moon, and suddenly it looked rather odd to us. And we came up to a position of approximately 1,000 feet, we could see this whole shroud out in reflected moonlight. And we reported this over Hawaii and moved into close formation. And we flew all the way around the docking adapter here. Particularly, we noticed the straps and these small items here that contain some explosive bolts. And from this close investigation, we'll have some movies to show you in a few minutes, we radioed uh, to Houston through Hawaii exactly what our analysis was, and it came out correct that either the lanyards were not installed or else they were installed but not connected, and the latter was the proper case. From this, we went to the flight plan that we had worked on, and again, we said it's going to be a flexible type of flight plan. We had various entities in the flight plan. We could take it and shift around each individual item, and that's exactly what happened. Neil Armstrong was Capcom at the time, and he said we'd go into the second rendezvous while Houston and the people at the Cape and also on the West Coast would make the analysis. From this, we went into a second rendezvous, which was the first pure optical rendezvous that had ever been performed. And it was on a passive target. And you want to show the maneuver on this to separation? <clears throat> on this rendezvous, Gene made all the computations. We did not use a computer, and the radar was only for a monitor, but we did not use the radar as far as the braking. We started out, and we burned. We got completely stabilized on top of the ATDA, and on Gene's mark, I burned about 15 miles an hour directly away from the center of the Earth. And naturally, that puts us above the ATDA, and when you're higher, you go slower. So we came around halfway around the world. We were 11 miles behind the ATDA, and then we crossed below it, came down three miles below it. Then at this time, we rolled over upside down, out in sunlight. Now, we rolled over upside down so we could blank the sun out of our eyes and also have the docking adapter and reflected sunlight. And one positive approach of having the shroud, it became very obvious to us that the shroud had about four times the reflectivity of the rest of the vehicle. So in this case, the shroud really helped us out on your, you can always find advantages to it some way, believe me. And, believe, and also on the rendezvous from above, it was a shroud that we first picked up. In fact, we might have missed it completely if, it, if we hadn't had the shroud on it. This, this was very important because we not only, as some of you know, we had a full moon on our flight. And not only could we see the, the bright colored white painted shroud in reflected sunlight, in other words, in sunlight that was coming over our shoulders and reflecting off the target so that we could see it, but actually after dark, we could see not the silver part of the ATDA, but we could see the white shroud in reflected moonlight, which was quite a beautiful sight. It was sort of a, a bluish reflected light. And this is the first time we've ever actually seen anything in reflected moonlight. And being able to see the target visually so that Tom can, can uh, track the target with his, with his reticle is very important not only to, to the computer for its calculations, but it's very important uh, to the pilot so that he can make uh, backup calculations. So, Having a shroud and reflected moonlight gave us a, quite a contrast as to what we can expect to see and what we cannot expect to see in different lighting conditions. We completed this rendezvous again coming in from below. We were upside down and came in directly below the docking adapter. And again, we want to test how good can man visually judge distance. Uh, when I, and looking up, even though the ATDA was slowly rotating like this, I could judge the length of this major axis so it's approximately the length of the original Agena. And looked in the, the markings in my reticle, and I gave Gene a mark. I said, we should be about one mile. Well, for data correlation, he hit the computer with the radar. We were 1.1 miles. So it was, it was obvious that we could judge distance very accurately in close and continue on in. Now, with respect to rendezvous, again, we want to bring out the point that an optical rendezvous from short distances is feasible. It will cost you an excess of fuel, and the best way we know today is with radar. And from here, we progressed on, had a sleep period, and did the third rendezvous. And the third rendezvous was the one that was very important to our lunar program. It simulated a profile that the lunar excursion module could have with the command module. 
Then this, we were positioned 150 miles out in front of the docking adapter and above it. Naturally, if we're above it, the, dock, the docking adapter catches up with us. And we came up along in space, blunt in forward. You want to take this to me? And track the vehicle looking down at it. In this case, we were approximately eight miles above it. And when we reached uh, 16 miles, we transferred. Now, we did have the docking adapter out in reflected moonlight, and it's probably one of the most brilliant bodies I've seen. Moonlight reflected off this white shroud and gave us a, a white circle, going a whitish blue circle going across the Earth that was approximately 10 times the diameter of Venus, as you see in the sky. However, when it came out in the sunrise, we are going over the Sahara Desert, and we lost the docking adapter from a tremendous body down to nothing. Now, the next time we saw it was approximately less than three miles, and at that time, we are looking straight down in the Sahara Desert, and the docking adapter looked to me just like a period on a piece of typing paper. That's all it was. And it was, again, really whizzing across the Sahara Desert. At that time, when you point down, you know you're going 18,000 miles an hour, believe me. And without radar, we would have never found the docking adapter and completely missed the rendezvous. So this points out some of the problems that we're going to encounter on the lunar mission and exactly how we will approach the problem. And uh, for any of you who are pilots, it's like making a high side pass supersonic out over the desert on another aircraft. It's really a, a classic example of relative motion. Here you're looking down, seeing the Earth go by, and also you're moving with respect to the docking adapter. Be I was just going to say that be, besides actually evaluating the, the technique of the rendezvous from above uh, and what some of its problems may be concerning lighting conditions and uh, when you actually want to change from your orbit to the target's orbit, we, and, and we'll get a good chance to see this, I think, in a minute, that the speed at which this target actually travels across the surface of the Earth. Uh, you don't appreciate this motion when you look up at the stars in the sky, but when you're looking down at the Earth, the target just just really moves across the surface of the Earth. And the other difficulty we encountered, which, which uh, Tom did mention subtly here, was the fact that, that uh, at distances beyond about three miles, I believe it was, that, that the, the reflected light from the Earth, or the fact that the Earth itself is so bright, and there's many clouds scattered throughout the world, uh, many different types of terrain, such as the desert that Tom mentioned, the target just completely disappears. Uh, you just can't find it. And, we're accustomed, accustomed to seeing, uh, I think, if we see an airplane in the sky, just even standing down here on the Earth, and uh, we happen to have lost it because it went behind a cloud, we can look at the other end of that cloud, and the airplane, in a short period of time, will appear or reappear. But when looking down at the Earth, traveling 17, 18,000 miles an hour, if you happen to see this particular target go over a lake, and then suddenly you don't see it any longer, uh, you've lost sight of it, uh, don't ever look back at that lake again because it's, it's probably many hundreds of miles beyond that. And this was one of, one of the uh, things we learned about actually visually tracking against a, a earth, earth, bright Earth background or, even more important, a bright Moon background. One thing that some of you probably heard that uh, on this rendezvous, uh, we did use a closed loop where the computer makes lots of computations, but errors are built in, into any system and every computer can only assume that the data coming into it is good. Well, in this case, we, the crew always makes computations on board, and we use Gene's computations for the transfer to make this maneuver. So I thought this was rather significant. This, this probably only Tom and Dave Scott and a few others can really appreciate. Uh, this is what the pilot does on the, uh, in the right-hand right seat when the command pilot is doing all the flying. Uh, Many times I've been asked, well, really, what do you do on a rendezvous and what goes on? The meaning of these numbers is insignificant at this time. But uh, during this period of time for all three of these rendezvous, this and the following chart, which you can go ahead and put down, are just, just some of the methods that we use uh, to calculate where we are, where we're going, and how much uh, increase in our velocity, how many miles an hour we have to add to the spacecraft at particular times in order to actually rendezvous and uh, get within close proximity of the target. One thing that we, that we had uh, at our disposal was three separate, different, and distinct uh, solutions to telling, telling us what to do. The ground would compute a solution telling us uh, exactly which direction to, to uh, fire our thrusters and how fast or how far to fire them. 
Uh, our computer and our radar combination gave us what we call our closed loop solution. And then we have this type of information, which is just calculated with the, uh, with the pen and pencil. So we had at our disposal three, three displays of information at which we could, uh, we could superimpose and, and then decide upon uh, for ourselves which actual solution was the one we wanted to burn based upon where we, where we felt we were and, and which solution would give us the, the most optimum and minimum fuel transfer. So in all of our rendezvous, we had this type of information. This type of information is computed, uh, is gathered every 100 seconds for about uh, oh, an hour before the actual time when you make the maneuver. So for about uh, a revolution around the world, this is what the pilot's doing prior to the actual transfer to the target orbit. A, a pencil, in this case, might be a single point failure, but we thought of that one. This is the uh, projection of the second rendezvous again. Should we burn radially up above the docking adapter? We went up above it approximately three miles, and we were trailing it by 11 miles halfway around the Earth, came back around, rolled over upside down, tracked it in reflected sunlight, made a small transfer maneuver of about four miles an hour, came in inverted, and broke optically. This whole part, this was just a setup for the final optical rendezvous, which is the first passive rendezvous ever been made. And uh, the 10, the Gemini 10 crew will attempt to make an optical rendezvous using the uh, Gina that's up there now. And it'll just be in a scale factor of about three of what we did here. So we got data to feed into the Gemini 10 crew. And also we learned a lot from this just later on if you do a rendezvous on an asteroid or some complete passive body in space. One real constraint. I mean, if you don't have flashing lights on a target, the only time you can do the rendezvous is out here in daylight. So at that altitude, we have about 53 minutes. This is the rendezvous from above. Again, we were coming along in a higher circular orbit. The target was in a lower circular orbit, and we were catching up to it, or it was coming to us. We made a maneuver. And again, a third of the way around the world, this was all out in daytime. We started down here out of the Atlantic Ocean, and we ended up going across the Sahara Desert, coming down and breaking over the Indian Ocean. The contrast we were able to observe in the colors, I think, was very worthwhile information because we had anticipated that silver paint actually would be almost equivalent to white uh, in visual acquisition, but it certainly was not. And here again, you can see what the ATDA, ATDA or a target looks like against di different backgrounds, against Earth background, even up close, and against a dark uh, black sky. When we flew close formation, we had to get clear of the dipole antenna as the vehicle rotated around. So we rolled over upside down and came over and put our windshield about four, three to four inches from the strap and stabilized here to look at the explosive bolts. Here you can see the antenna rotating towards us. Very soon you'll see a sequence here where the ground commanded the, the uh, docking cone to rigidize, and uh, when it rigidized, it actually changed the configuration of the alligator jaws very slightly. Again, here we are rolled upside down, and we're just within a couple inches of it, as you can see each part. Almost feel like you're going to get your nose snapped off here. One thing is we, we learned, and we saw this back on Gemini 6, the way that the Gemini windows are offset, when one individual gets real close to the a vehicle, it's, it's hard for the other individual to, to really see it. Here again, we're really in close to a couple inches of it, and we're shooting right here on the connectors. <coughs> uh, 
Uh, Tom was actually uh, station keeping during his period of time on the on a rotating vehicle, uh, which is something that uh, we experienced slightly during Gemini uh, 6 and 7, but of course with the Agena, uh, we have a com continually stabilized vehicle and makes station keeping a great deal easier. So having a, a drifting or rotating vehicle was pretty much of a challenge, I think, uh, and we both got a chance to take a good look at the station keeping. I think this is sequence when the ground sends commands, and you shouldn't see the so they move back and forth when they send the rigidized and unrigidized command. The shroud would move back and forth, and we could observe this and report it to the ground. <laughs> this uh, this now probably gives you a good feel for for that spear in the belly of the alligator type of thing. I don't think we can really overlook the background of the horizon and the, uh, the world behind it. It was just a tremendous background for all these pictures, uh, and it never got old even after three days. Here you can see earth shine down below and sunshine up above, and the contrast you have between the two. Pretty classic example right there. And that was, that's an exact time reference of the rate of rotation that the ATDA was doing. What I'd, what I'd like to do in the EVA, it, uh, I feel, feel that I must have been over it about uh, 30 times in technical debriefings, and that's not my goal here today. I'd just like to run, run through very briefly uh, what our plans were and uh, what we did as we went along, just identifying where the problems were that we ran into, and then I would like to then summarize what we found out um, from encountering these problems in, uh, in the real time or actual flight situation and what we've discovered since, uh, since we uh, we've been here debriefing in Houston. We had a, uh, a two day and one night uh, EVA flight planned. Uh, we went through almost this entire period. We uh, spent the first day on what we call umbilical evaluation, evaluations, finding out what the capabilities of man were uh, to to maneuver uh, on the umbilical, to use Velcro or sticky type pads and try and walk around the spacecraft, to use handholds on the spacecraft and find out what our capabilities or limitations of moving from one point of the spacecraft to the other, uh, what these problems or, or difficulties might be, or what ease uh, we had in maneuvering around the spacecraft. We also uh, were investigating during this first period, first daylight period, the uh, operation of a new environmental control system, which is called the, we call it chest pack or the uh, ELSS. Uh, we've never flown this chest pack before in actual flight. Uh, it's somewhat different, uh, has uh, longer capability than what, what Ed White flew on GT4. So we were looking, looking for uh, the capabilities and reactions of this chest pack to keep cool, to ventilate, uh, and to maintain the, certainly the required suit pressures that we would need for extravehicular activity. We did all this during the first day pass with, uh, with no difficulty. We came back with some data and recommendations on umbilical evaluation, umbilical lengths, and uh, how actually to handle yourself uh, when floating in the near proximity of the spacecraft. Uh, we felt that the ELSS during this period of time on its, on its medium flow uh, operated very satisfactory, factory, uh, factorily, and there was uh, certainly a great deal of comfort on my part uh, in terms of temperature control, in terms of total oxygen supply, and in terms of suit integrity. That is, the, my suit pressure never varied from what I had expected to see and what I had seen in our chamber runs here back in Houston. We uh, then returned just towards the end of this period, uh, had planned to return to the hatch area. We had the hatch open all this period of time. Returned to the hatch area, and we were going to make some film pack uh, changes on the camera, on the extravehicular camera, which we did without any difficulty. I took the camera off the back or outside of the spacecraft and gave it to Tom, and he made some film and lens changes. We put the camera back in position. Uh, we had, uh, again, somewhat of a, of a problem 
uh, keeping my feet where we wanted to. You may have heard uh, pull me down, Tom, a number of times, and uh, this was more of a, a, a convenience type thing because my feet tended to float in places where I didn't really have a, a good foothold uh, in order to reach. When you reach for something, you want to you want to have either a, a toe hold or a, or a hand hold, and many of these re these tasks that we were doing at this even at this period of time required two hands. So you have to restrain yourself in some fashion. This is why uh, hold on to my leg, Tom, or pull my leg down, Tom, type of thing uh, occurred during this period of time. We, uh, we did make these changes, and uh, we had a short rest period, at which at that time was, was uh, really not needed because the, the amount of work done uh, just in floating around, in and around the spacecraft and, and uh, checking out the umbilical and putting in cameras and putting on rear view mirrors and other extravehicular equipment around the spacecraft was is very slight and uh, it's very comparable to what you might expect uh, to find right here in 1G. We uh, then it was this is still daytime and uh, comfort of the pilot my comfort was uh, very fine. Tom had had accelerated uh, or exhibited uh, his capabilities to operate pressurized within the spacecraft, which is something I think we all often tend to overlook, but he was now flying the spacecraft in what we call a hard suit. And in a hard suit, it's very difficult for him to move around and grab switches and move hand controllers. Uh, apparently, he had little or no problems along these lines. It's about the same thing as a Frankenstein monster trying to play Chinese checkers back and forth. Like <laughs> it is rather clumsy. Uh, one thing with this that amazed me at the first I'm sure all of you have gone swimming along with a boat, and when you want to get into a boat, even, even a good boat, size boat that weighs four and 5,000 pounds, when you reach up and grab a hold of it in the water, you tilt the whole boat. Well, down here on Earth on a boat, you have water to damp it, but it became immediately clear to me that Gene was producing a lot of torque on the vehicle, and we're in real good communications, and when he'd come back on the adapter and get near the thruster section back here, I would turn off the control power. And in one 30-second period, he pitched me up 30 degrees. And then I had to slowly pulse back down and come back into the control mode. And when he finally went back into the adapter, I had the control mode off for approximately three minutes, a little over. We're going uh, small and forward. In that period of time, Gene turned me around 150 degrees, rolled me inverted, and pitched me down 40 degrees. So I could tell he was putting out uh, a considerable effort as far as torquing the spacecraft. Uh, However, I must say that even though we were upside down, pitch down, and yawed around, it made no difference to either myself or Gene because we went right through the work task uh, as we planned. We, uh, I might emphasize at this point that there's no doubt about the fact that uh, it, was, it was pretty fantastic being out there. Uh, just the fact that you, you had left the bounds of the spacecraft and uh, we were at that time some 180 uh, statute miles above the surface of the Earth. And, it certainly was a beautiful sight and uh, something that I look forward to very much to doing again. But there was no, absolutely no disorientation. I didn't, uh, I never felt lost. Uh, I never felt, uh, although you're floating around on the umbilical with, uh, and you sort of wish you did have a propulsion system at that time to go exactly where you wanted to go, I never felt that I lacked any capability to get back to the spacecraft uh, at any time I so desired. Uh, it was pretty fantastic, certainly, at this point, and I think I may have commented uh, about that, too. But continuing, we were in daylight, and continuing on with our, our desired work task, as we had gone through many times and had them laid out, we uh, now closed the hatch. We, uh, we didn't lock it for a number of reasons, not that I didn't trust Tom, but, uh, <laughs> but we did have an umbilical coming out of the hatch, and we closed the hatch within two inches of being fully closed, and the main reason we did this was uh, thermal control of hatch seals of, uh, of in the interior of the spacecraft. Uh, you know, the temperatures go to both extremes of hot and cold, and we were concerned about keeping our hatch seal, for one thing, within, within uh, limits of being soft so we would have no problems closing the hatch. I might say that this was probably the first real work task or physical task that I encountered. That, that was of closing the hatch, of pulling the hatch closed, because here again, uh, you have, you just have two hands to work with and you cannot restrain your feet in any fashion. But we did get the hatch closed, at which time uh, I progressed back to the adapter section of the spacecraft, or the back end of the spacecraft. And 
for those of you who are not extremely familiar, we all here at MSC are, I know, but, but this adapter area is, is a white area of the spacecraft, and I progressed back, back from the hatch area after it was closed over the top of the spacecraft and back into this area right here. And this is where our, the majority of, of our work tasks were going to be done. The, uh, the uh, adapter is where the, where the AMU was and where we did all this donning. Now, I'd like to, we have this very adapter over here, and I'm going to step over here just for a second. To give you an idea, you've heard about, about positioning problems, and some of you may have known what we were going to do prior to, to our, our flight, but maybe you might get a better idea for, for purposes of, of relative simplicity, because I'm standing up, we have the adapter actually located vertically, but in reality, this is the top of the spacecraft right here. And so in space, uh, I was roughly at 90 to 100 degrees uh, laying sort of on my side. Now, this was mainly because this is where the ATDA, or excuse me, the, the AMU fit into the adapter of the spacecraft. And this again, although when I got back there and I Instead of looking down at the Earth, I saw the horizon of the Earth going across my side. This had uh, didn't bother me a bit. It, it uh, didn't feel unusual, and it didn't hamper any of our operations. I actually came and brought the umbilical around the top of the adapter through this guide to make sure that it stayed clear of all thrusters, because as soon as I actually got around the edge of the adapter, Tom was now free to turn the thrusters on and uh, put the spacecraft in a proper attitude of heads up, pointing forward. Uh, this was no real problem. You've seen pictures of the Gemini 6 and the Gemini 7 flight where, where uh, there was a lot of conversation about all the debris that was hanging from the adapter. Our adapter was beautiful. There was not one inch of any of this uh, encapsulating material, any of this plastic uh, uh, hose type things hanging down at all. The adapter, of course, was sharp as we anticipated it to be. And here again is why we brought the umbilical around the edge. Now, the first... The first uh, one of the first things we wanted to do, of course, was get in these stirrups right here. And uh, with both feet in the stirrups, I don't mean to turn my back on you, but I'll just get here just for a minute. And this was our, our basic position to don the AMU. And all our work was, was pointed in this direction. This is why uh, the spacecraft was my reference. And as far as the rest of the world was concerned, whether we were pointed up or down, uh, had little or no effect. Now, by nature and by plan, and because we had we had trained this way, the majority of all our operations, there's many valves, which I won't go into, many uh, harnesses, electrical and oxygen connections, uh, many other details of the handrails that all take two hands to operate with. And uh, we feel that just because we're extravehicular, there's no reason to go out there with one hand tied behind your back. In other words, uh, you ought to be able to use two hands to accomplish any desired task, uh, do any workload that you so desire. Well. We had gone through this in a zero-g airplane, and we knew pretty much what the problems were going to be. As a result, we did put these or re foot stirrups or re retention so that your feet would not float up. Well, as it turned out, uh, we did have a positioning problem, which I, I won't, uh, I'll just identify and attempt to go into a little bit later, but we did have a positioning problem where I continued to float out of the stirrups and uh, did not have, have freedom of both hands for any continued length of time. Uh, this is why, uh, or this is, as a, let me say this, as a result, I had to work continually against a pressure suit, against the, the stiffness of the suit, and uh, this work then uh, had to be taken out through the environmental control system. This, was, this is a type of work that was not really useful work, but it was work that, that I had to do to maintain my position. Well, about the time that I got, got here, uh, into the back end of the area and started working, connecting some hooks on a tether. Uh, the sun was just about to go down, and Tom, being in the front of the spacecraft, was almost in total darkness, and I was in, in total sunlight. And I uh, immediately got very warm on the back, and I'll explain this in a minute, but I got extremely hot in the back, as a matter of fact, in the small of the back area. We stopped and took a rest. Uh, until the sun went down, and then we continued on with, with uh, some of our, our task of operating and, and donning the AMU. About this time is when uh, my visor started fogging up, because this in itself is your life support. The, uh, 
the problem then started as soon as it got dark, the, the uh, visor fogged up. We had conversations back and forth about this. Uh, we knew what was happening and it was just a case of <coughs> continuing on because we were not time limited. We actually had allowed a uh, hundred percent pad in in terms of how long it would take us to do any sep any task here on Earth or in the zero-g airplane. We doubled that time just so we know we'd have enough time. And I then then just looked out into the black night. It was dark at this time, and uh, it was there was no discrete difference between Earth and night. In other words, I could not actually see a horizon. I uh, I won't say I became a little lonely at this time, but. Uh, but as I was sitting there, we had, we had one light uh, instead of two, again, which really didn't cause any problems. One of the lights just did not come on. The light appeared to me as I was looking out, out my visor as, a, as a, uh, an automobile light coming through, a, not a dense fog, but a, but a misty type fog. So we discussed it, and this is a point at which Tom and I decided to, to uh, abort the EMU mission, not knowing really how far we could get. Believe me, this is a this is a real ride. Tom was knew what to look for, and I had been told what to look for. But uh, it's very difficult to describe. And I know those of us who have been there uh, just hope everyone uh, could ever could always have this chance. It's just fantastically beautiful and uh, something you can never repeat here on Earth. So look, guys, all I can say it scares me. <laughs> Gina, okay. that's for, that's what you get for going twice. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I was too new to, be, uh, to me to be scared. Uh, Gene obtained the first three and a half minutes. I obtained the last three and a half. So at the time we were shooting pictures and uh, watching the needles and flying the spacecraft. Kind of a busy job. Just backing up a minute to when retro fire occurs, uh, it, it was quite, a, quite an experience just to have those retros fires. But, but when they do, there's no doubt about the fact that you're coming home. You may not know exactly where right away, but there's no doubt that uh, you're on your way. Now, at this time, I'm pulling nearly full lift. We had a, two hot retros, and so we lifted in quite a ways to the carrier. And full lift in Germany is upside down. Your feet's against the sky, your head's in the earth. And we're backed about 20 degrees uh, off the complete upside down position. We finally come into what would be our zero lift line. We get zero lift, we roll the Germany. And you'll see this shortly. I put full controller deflection in and we start to roll. The G-forces at this time are building up so that you're actually now, forced back into the back of your seat. Now we're starting to roll. We've, we've reached the zero lift line. We know we should pull about zero lift and the wash should be down uh, in front of us there about 300 miles away. And we're rolling around about 15 degrees a second. You're seeing a black shot come over and make a tremendous hot spot on the nose section. See, there, see that shot burning on the nose? 